Hey guys, this is another episode of Design, Develop, Share. I'm David Anderson, and we're going to do part two of a exploration of leetcode.com. So again, if you haven't seen my previous video, I'll link that down in the description below. But basically, leetcode.com is a problem-solving platform. And today we're going to look at actually solving a problem on this platform, one that I've taken a look at. And it's a fairly simple but interesting problem. And so we're going to go up here to the problem section at the top. And what we're doing is problem number three of their algorithm section, which is the longest substring without repeating characters. And this one's a medium difficulty problem that they've categorized. And according to that difficulty, only 28.6% of all submissions are accepted. And as we talked about, only accepted solutions are ones that passed all test cases that they throw at you. So the problem is, given a string, find the length of the longest substring without repeating characters. And example one is they give you an input of ABC, ABC, BB, and the output should be three. And the explanation for that is because the, the substring ABC is the longest substring in this text without repeating characters. And so the length is three in example two. Obviously the output is one because the longest string without repeating characters would be just B by itself. And then the third example they give is PWWKEW -W -E with also an output of three because WKE is the longest substring in that text. And the interesting thing about that is there's also this KEW part it's still a length of three, so it doesn't matter which one, but the longest substring inside here is has a length of three. So those are the basic examples for the problem. So we're actually going to walk through solving this just like we would any other problem on this site. So I'm going to take us to a PowerPoint slide and just kind of describe the approach that we're going to take. We're going to take a brute force approach. So this isn't necessarily going to be the fastest way of solving this problem, but it will be probably the easiest solution to write code for. And so as the problem description, we're going to use ABC, ABC, AB as an example and kind of break this down. And so if we look at this piece of text, we can first identify how many substrings are in this piece of text. So we have first off the whole string itself, ABC, ABC, AB. And then from there, if we go through each individual character, in that string, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven additional substrings. Now, the problem doesn't say that we need to process the string in reverse order or anything like that. We're not going to move characters around. So this is the maximum number of substrings that we have to care about given the constraints of the problem. So if we look at how to solve this problem using a brute force approach, literally what that means is we're going to go through every potential substring in this text and we're going to count how many unique characters or check for even duplicate characters for each substring. So it's not the fastest because we have to search everything. So the way this would work is basically we would loop through first each character in the string. And knowing that, that would basically be like in an iterator block, that would be like position I. So we have A at zero, B at one, C at two, three, four, so on and each one of those is a sub substring. So once we have identified the substring position, then we can write a second iterator block, and then we can loop through the substring, and now we can start counting duplicate characters. And we're gonna use a hash set, which is a lot faster than using an array or just an arbitrary list. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna add each one of those characters to that hash set. And once we run into a case where we have a duplicate, adding that character to the hash set should fail, because the hash code is going to be identical. And we know we have identified a duplicate character in that substring. And that's also going to give us the ability to count how many unique characters might exist. And then ultimately we'll do that for each substring. Finally, until we come up with a, the, the longest, uh, uh, the largest count as our result, and we'll return that largest count from the function. So in the case of this example, we can process all the way to the end till we get to CAB and we know there's a count of three unique characters, no repeating characters of any kind. 
we can process after that a b and b but those are just uh, there's two unique characters and then one so the output in this example would be three so it's a fairly straightforward approach so to do that we're first going to declare us some variables so we know that we need to return the count of the longest the length of the longest substring so we're going to just create some boilerplate code, boilerplate code there now we also know that we need to loop through each character in this string. And again, they've given us some boilerplate code. So they've given us a function that returns an int length of long substring, and then they've given us the input of s. So s would basically be the text that we're going to search. So we have our initial iterator block. And once we're in here, we know that now we can basically create ourselves a hash set where we can start tracking unique characters in each substring. And we're also going to create another integer value, and this is where we're actually going to track the actual count of unique characters. The hash set's really just used as a utility in this algorithm. Um, so let's go ahead and create our second iterator block, and this will we'll call this J. And what we're going to do is we're going to start J's position at the position of the character in this, the text that we're processing, because basically this is the starting point of our substring. And again, we have to go to the end of the string. So we're going to increment J. And what we're going to do in this case is we're basically going to start adding characters to our set. So we're going to say, in the case of the .NET framework, the hash set has a add function. That would return true or false if it was added to the set successfully based on the, the hash code of the item being added. So we're going to basically say if set add s of j, so that's the character at position j of that particular substring. And what we're going to do is if that was added successfully, we're going to increment y because we've identified a unique character. If it fails to be added to that hash set, then we know we've identified a duplicate character. And so in this particular instance, we've identified as many unique characters as we can. We're just going to break. We don't need to process any further in that substring. And we also know that we've identified as many as possible. We don't care how many there are if there's duplicates. If there's duplicates at all, we know that it's not going to be the desired outcome. So at the end of the substring processing, then we basically can do something like, so if our number of unique characters in this current set is greater than the previous number of unique characters in any prior last set. We want that to be our new result. So we're basically gonna assign X to Y, and then at the end we're gonna return X. So let's actually take this and run this through a basic test case. So we're gonna take the ABC, ABC, BB, as an example, we're going to run this code. So in the bottom right-hand corner, you just hit run code. And it takes a few milliseconds. So we had 88 milliseconds that that ran in. We can see the input that it ran in. The output of our algorithm was three. And the test case expected outcome was also three. So that's a successful test case. So we can change this. And what I'll often do is use some of their examples if they're provided. And I'll run each one of those examples. So an input of b, 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 output of one, expect value of one, so that's great. I'm going to take their p, w, w, k, e, w test case, and we're going to run that. And we have an output of three with an expected output of three, so that's also good. Now what you would want to do in this case is actually come up with a lot more test cases on your own before you make your submission, because they're going to run this through potentially zero to many thousands of test cases. It just varies from problem to problem. Now, I've already written this algorithm, so instead of submitting it, I'm gonna come over here to submissions at the top, and we're gonna take a look. So my first submission was accepted, ran in 340 milliseconds, which again is the probably the aggregate of running this algorithm on all test cases with 24 megabytes of memory consumption. I'm gonna click on that, and we can see that that submission beats 16.35% of all submissions as far as runtime performance. And we can see that the memory consumption beats almost 11% of other submissions. 
and you can see the pretty much the same solution there. If we go back to the top really quick, we can also see that it ran my algorithm through 987 test cases. So that's quite a few. So when you're writing these solutions, you want to really think about inputs and outputs. You want to think a lot about edge cases. There are some problems that I worked on that were a lot more difficult. So for example, let's take reverse integer as a problem and look at my submissions there. And you can see that I got quite a few, uh, some runtime errors, uh, which I mean that the code just flat out failed or we had some wrong answers, meaning the code was able to run and execute, but it just produced the an undesirable result. And then finally I had some accepted outcomes. And then I was playing with runtime performance in different algorithms. And so this is an example of where this problem had a lot of edge cases. They had 1,032 test cases. So it's very difficult to think about all the different test cases up front, but you should at least think about as many as you can. Now, the cool thing is if your algorithm fails on something, they will actually tell you where it failed. So for example, we had this runtime error down here. It'll actually tell you that an exception was thrown, system.format exception, input string was not in the correct format. So likely that was from an int.parse. And you could see the input that they gave to the algorithm was negative 123. More than likely though, in my algorithm, what happened was the negative, the sign was probably at the end and did not represent a valid integer. And so it threw a format exception on int.parse. That's more than likely what happened on that submission. We can go look at a couple other submissions. So we had, uh, you know, that was a runtime error. If we go look at a wrong answer, we can see that on test case 1029, the, out, the input was a very large number and the expected value was zero, but my algorithm actually did produce some output. And more than likely, this was a result of not handling overflow calculations correctly in the algorithm. So submitting your code and failing is not a bad thing. It, you are going to inevitably have some failures in your submissions because you just can't account for a thousand plus test cases. But if you're pretty diligent, you probably can get very close. And with a low number of submissions, you can solve the problem until ultimately you come up with the solution. And as I described, some of these problems are a lot harder on the surface than they sound. You know, just reversing an integer, you can do that using string manipulation. So if we go look at that submission one more time, Let's look at the uh, first accepted solution here. This was using string manipulation, where basically we take the integer parameter, we par uh, convert that to a string representation of that integer, convert it to a character array, turn that character array to a list, and then use the reverse method that the list API provides, and then take a new string based on that character, the reverse character array, and then we check for the signage, and then ultimately we do our integer parsing. So while that's a logically correct solution, it's most certainly not the desirable solution. It's not very fast. So then we go to the ultimate solution, which is using math. And so there's no string manipulation here at all. There's also no error handling. There's no try-catch blocks to account for overflow or format exceptions. We're basically using math to check for overflow and actually doing the uh, reversal of the integer value. And ultimately, this is the kind of thing that they're looking for when you're solving these problems is there's an actu there's usually a best way or one of a few best ways to solve these problems. So the platform is really cool in that regard. So if we go back to our longest substring example, I've only solved this one using a brute force solution so far. I've not explored other alternatives, but they do offer that as the first approach. And that was probably for most people when you go into the solution tab, approach number one is probably going to be the most intuitive solution that comes to mind, but it's not necessarily the best. So then they talk about like approach number two using a sliding window algorithm. And then there might be, you know, approach number three, a similar version of a sliding window, but with optimizations. And essentially what they're getting at, like in this algorithm, is there's points in your algorithm where you can actually ignore large portions of your string because you've, you can check to see if you've already looked at that aspect of it and you don't have to repeat yourself. And that's what makes the algorithm faster. So it's kind of cool that they give you lots of code examples. They also talk again about like the time complexity of the algorithm. 
So they usually talk about that using big O notation. So kind of a cool thing. And then the discussions are kind of nice to see. So that's pretty much it as far as the experience goes for the platform. So one other thing I want to show you is actually your profile. So you can actually go to your profile in the upper right hand corner. And the other thing that they do is they actually track all of your submissions. So they keep a list of most recent submissions. They also keep track of your activity. So you can kind of see, I just started using leak code probably about a week, week and a half ago. And you can see my activity there. Over on the left hand side, you can see how many contests you've been involved in, your, your ranking compared to others on the platform. And then the other thing that I probably like the most is you can see how many questions you've solved out of how many are available how many submissions have been accepted, and ultimately your acceptance rate. So right now for me, this is kind of a new experience, my acceptance rate is 41.4%. And oftentimes that's just because my approach to solving problems is oftentimes I, I know there's gonna be a thousand test cases, I'd rather submit and fail early and get that immediate feedback so I can keep correcting the algorithm rather than spend a long period of time writing an algorithm that might fail anyway. So I'll make more submissions early and often, which I think comes from me doing a lot of test driven development, red, green, refactor. That's kind of the approach that you want to take. And their platform honestly is almost like writing unit tests. You are writing the algorithm itself, but they already have the unit tests there for you. So submitting often is not a bad thing. If you want to pride yourself on having a higher acceptance rate, that's great. Uh, but it's I, I wouldn't I don't think it's something to to frown upon at all And then ultimately they do track your points So your points are like those coins that you can earn where you can redeem uh, Prizes again, you can grab like t-shirts uh, You can actually earn yourself a premium subscription and supposedly a premium subscription unlocks additional problems you can solve and Access to other features on the site. I've not really looked at that in depth and the other thing I'll say that's nice too is they also have just a playground uh, that you can explore. And so it's just a way for you to write some code and you can actually get console output. So if you need to just execute some arbitrary C Sharp or JavaScript to C++ in the browser pretty quickly, they offer a little sandbox that you can do that in. So that's kind of cool because there's a lot of times even in my day-to-day -day work where I just need to write a little algorithm and I don't want to set up a whole lot of infrastructure. I might just want to write a, a function with some inputs and outputs. And so you can kind of do that here. And you can, most, I've, what I've observed so far is most namespaces are imported by their platform. I've not had the need to import additional namespaces. But I do believe that there was a way, and I don't know if it was through their articles or the discussion, where if you had to import additional namespaces, you could. But anyway... So that's kind of the. So that's kind of uh, how you would solve problems on LeakCode.com. So have at it. Go out there, solve them all. Let me know what you think. Again, uh, if you like this video, give me a like, give me a subscribe, and we'll definitely see you next time.